to go ahead and use ground control points in a PIX4D project. So let me go ahead and show my, my presentation here. Hopefully we, we have it up on the screen now for everybody to see. Yep, it's working now. Super, okay, I apologize for those technical snafus. We'll do better here on out, I promise. So the first question is, like, what are ground control points? And so when we're working within PIX4D, there's a number of different types of points we wanna keep in mind. The first type of point we wanna talk about is a key point. And a key point is really a unique color or texture that's found by the software in an image as it's going through and looking at each image on a pixel by pixel basis, looking for these unique colors and textures. And then the software will go through and try to match up those images, if you will. And when it finds two or more images that have matching key points, that key point becomes something called an automatic tie point. And this is the basis or what's created at the end of step one processing. There's some other points that you'll be from, may be familiar with within PIX4D. The first one's called a manual tie point. And this manual tie point is a point or a pixel that you identify in multiple images as the user, but you don't necessarily have an XYZ coordinate to specify what the exact location is. You're just telling the software each of these images, this is the exact same pixel. Then the next type of point we come to is the ground control point, which is the, the meat of the matter here today. And a ground control point is a point with a known location that you mark in multiple images. And so this ground control point could be a 2D ground control point with X and Y, or it could be a 3D ground control point with X, Y, and Z. The 3D control point is definitely preferred. That way you're getting the appropriate altitude or elevations within your model as well. And then the last type of point is a checkpoint. And a checkpoint is really just like a ground control point. It's a point that you mark in multiple images with an X, Y, that you have an X, Y, Z value for. But with a checkpoint, this data is withheld from the software during processing. And then you use this as a check, if you will, afterwards to see how close the computed value comes into the checked value. And then that really tells you what the accuracy of your project is. So you'll want to have both ground control points and checkpoints as a part of a project to really be able to validate the accuracy of that project. And so your next thought is, well, do I really need control points? I and mean, I've done a lot of projects and they always seem to come out looking pretty good. And so what I have here on the screen is an overlay graphic that I did recently using just a, a very simple DJI drone. I think this was the DJI Spark drone. I flew over a, a local area here. And when I process the data, I have my overlay orthomosaic on top of the base data. And you may notice that there's a shift here amongst the model that you can see there's a circular kind of concrete fountain area on the left-hand side that has a blue line going over to what looks like the same circular kind of concrete area. And so this shows that when I process my data from my DJI Spark, while it processed and got very good relative accuracy that the widths and lengths of my building are very close within about a half a foot of each other, I can see that my entire project is shifted about 30 to, or about 50 feet to one direction. And so this is why you really need to have some ground control point to make your model really fit real world coordinates. And that's the key that we're gonna talk about here today. So not only do you end up with a horizontal shift, but this graphic here showing kind of a side view of a project shows both a small horizontal shift that you can see with these blue cones that are kind of hovering midair in the model. Those blue cones are the initial location of the GCP data or the ground control point data when I entered it into the software. And then after I optimized it and got things um, corrected, if you will, it shows that the point is really supposed to be down where the green spot is down below. So we can see there's a very uh, significant amount of vertical offset between my project of where it is and where it really should be. And this is because we have something called the height above an ellipsoid and a geoid. And we'll get into that a little bit further as we go along in this training. And so what, what we're dealing with here is, as this slide shows, is the only thing flat earthers have to fear is sphere itself. And what is the issue here is because the earth world or earth is round, it's difficult sometimes to get proper Cartesian coordinates or coordinates for a flat um, map or a model onto a round surface without some type of distortion. And so the types of distortions that you get when you try to take a round globe, if you will, and then project information from that, you can see depending on what kind of projection information you use that you get different types of distortions. The distortions we see here on these maps are distortions that are were created by um, a gentleman by the name of Getamine, these are Getamine profiles that show how the human head looks distortion-wise on a globe as you look at different kinds of projections. 
And our goal while dealing with mapping is to try to reduce the amount of distortion or error in any of our maps that we're producing. And to do that, we really need to have good quality ground control. And so we were talking earlier about the world being a sphere. And actually, it's not really a sphere around. It's certainly not flat either. But the general shape of the Earth is actually what's called an ellipsoid. And this ellipsoid is really a mathematical representation of the shape of the Earth. And it's a flattened sphere, if you will, where we have a larger um, major axis here along the equator and a little bit shorter minor axis along the pole. And because of this shape, the, 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 the world is actually, if you will, in mathematical terms, referred to as an ellipsoid. And so, as I just said, this world is an ellipsoid. And I should also say that the planet Earth is actually not spherical, or it's spherical, but not a sphere. It's actually something called an oblate spheroid, and that's because it's a little bit wider than it is tall, if you will. And so because it's an oblate spheroid, it's actually very difficult to find the center of the Earth. If the Earth were actually round, it would be much easier to find what the center is. And so what we have here is we have a mathematical model of the Earth that is called the ellipsoid. And that's really what GPS data reports back. You get a value from a GPS hardware related to the height above the ellipsoid, which is this mathematical model of the Earth. And we can see in the graphic here that the ellipsoid and the geoid, if you will, are separated. And the geoid is more of a generalization of the Earth if you could sort of flatten the land masses a little bit, if you will, and have a continuous um, mean sea level across the, the Earth, even though we have different amounts of gravity and different shapes and contours to the Earth itself, you end up with this sort of mathematical model called a geoid that is supposed to be the actual representation of the Earth. And so what we're trying to do is find actual accurate elevations and horizontal information and take into account these differences between the Earth's geoid, if you will, or shape, and then the Earth's ellipsoid that we get data back from the GPS when it's being processed. And so just as a little aside here, while I was researching this information, I found it's actually possible for you to print off your own 3D model of what the, um, the world geoid looks like. You can actually go out to the NOAA website here that I have linked, shown on this, web, this page here, and you can download an STL file and actually print off a 3D model of the geoid for the Earth. So that's just kind of a fun little aside here. And then, so the last term I want to talk about is datums. And datum is a term that you may not have been familiar with before, but essentially the, a geodetic datum is an abstract coordinate system that serves to provide known locations to begin surveys and create maps. And so you have both a horizontal datum, which helps define the relationship between the ellipsoid that we were speaking about earlier and the, the ellipsoid that is adopted as the mode, as the model, I'm sorry, and the Earth shape of the, of the Earth itself. And so this horizontal datum is, ba is a base reference for the coordinate system. It includes the position of its initial point or origin and the orientation of the ellipsoid model at the surface of the Earth that models the surface of the Earth and the rest of the region of interest. So there's a local, is typically then the horizontal datum would be a localization of a specified ellipsoid model. And there's also then a global um, datum for the WGS84 um, latitude longitude, which is sort of the coordinate system that GPS typically reports data back in. And then what we're trying to determine really is the appropriate vertical datum. And the vertical datum is used for measuring elevations of points on the sea level all around the, um, all around the world. And unfortunately, the mean sea level in England isn't actually the same mean sea level you might have in San Francisco, that the water doesn't really distribute perfectly around the world. And so you have this variance in the geoid and ellipsoid separation. And so what we're ultimately trying to do when we capture GPS data to create a map or a model is we want to come up with what's referred to as the orthometric height, or the orthometric height here in this graphic being shown as the big H kind of here in the center. And we're trying to take the information that we get from our GPS equipment, which will be an ellipsoidal height, compare that with our geoid height information at a particular location, and then come up with what we call the orthometric height. And that's the true height or the mean sea level height that we're looking for. And this may seem all a bit obtuse here at first, and I'm not trying to train anyone to be a land surveyor in this webinar. What I'm trying to just do is give everybody sort of a, a basis for some of the terms that are used in reference for collecting geospatial data to make an accurate map.
So let's talk about how we really collect GPS points to have accuracy for our project. And so the first thing we want to determine or discuss here in that case is what is the accuracy required by the project that you're working on? And that the accuracy that you're required for the project will really dictate how you want to go about collecting the data. And so when you're using GPS equipment, you want to consider using the very best GPS equipment available. We have here sort of a breakdown on what the expected accuracies are from various types of GPS equipment. And so if you're using an autonomous handheld type of GPS, like maybe a Trimble Geo XH or XM or some kind of like a, even a, a tr uh, not even a Trimble, a, a, just a Garmin GPS Map 60, et cetera, you'll get about within 15 meters of the proper point, but that's fairly far off. So if you're using a handheld GPS that's getting a real-time correction source, something called a, a satellite-based augmentation system, or here in the U.S. it's called WAS, you can get that value down to maybe one to five meters. But when you're dealing with a orthomosaic or a model that you're creating that may have pixel sizes at or below one inch in size, having the amount of variability in your GPS ground control points of one to five meters, you're going to actually introduce errors into your project by trying to use that data. So as we kind of skip down here to the bottom, the bottom line is, if you will, that you really need to use what we'll call post-process carrier phase differential GPS. That may also be referred to as maybe a survey grade GPS or a dual band receiver, something that receives both what we'll call an L1 and an L2 um, broadcast from the GPS. And with that type of technology, you can do differential correction and get very precise measurements from the GPS, GPS itself, where you're down to what we'll call centimeter level accuracy. And that's really the type of equipment you need to use when you're dealing with mapping purposes and you're trying to create survey accurate maps. And so when you're going to create your ground control points or put them out on the ground, what should your GCP really look like? And so we have two examples here on the left that are less than ideal. And certainly, you may not always have the option to have very nice black and white sort of or orange and black kind of ground control targets. But these large X's that have been used in the, the past, if you will, for some ground control point work, you'll notice that they don't have a very clearly or well-defined centroid or center. This white X here at the top, you can see there's about a, what looks to be about a three or four inch square there that and certainly the GPS, I hope, was set up right in the center, but when you're trying to mark that within the software, it's hard to pick the exact pixel within just a, a centimeter or so of where you were actually having the GPS set. And so you want to avoid these kind of large white X's or even like this black X here, where on the black X you have, it looks to be about six inch kind of black cross there. So you have maybe a 36 square inch area to really pick that pixel. And it's not a very accurate way to pick the specific pixel that we're looking for. So these targets here on the right that show the green check box next to them, that's really the type of ground control target I'd encourage folks to use. You want to be able to very clearly delineate and see the centroid or the center pixel right where you had your GPS equipment set up at to maintain the highest level of accuracy in your data. And so now that we've figured out what kind of targets we want to use, we want to talk about how we want to distribute them across our project. And once again, I'm not a licensed land surveyor, but I have done quite a number of projects and all the land surveyors I have spoken with over time have typically reported back that they like to put out a ground control point every 500 to 1,000 feet. And so certainly that will depend on the size of your project and the amount of level of accuracy you need, but the surveyors I've spoken with suggest putting a ground control point about every 500 to 1,000 feet. It's good to have these control points, if you will, near a feature of interest or an area that is of specific interest of that project. If you have variable elevations over your project, it's always good to mix up your locations a bit so you're getting them at varied elevations if the site is variable. And a key thing is you want to avoid having your points within a straight line. Whenever you put your ground control points in a straight line, you run a chance of what we call creating an axis of rotation in your project and you can have your end result be a little bit skewed. So what we're looking for is good triangulation amongst all of our ground control points. If we look at this example here at the bottom of the screen with the orange lines and the red dots, this would be similar to doing a corridor project if you're doing like a roadway or a pipeline or something like that. And so certainly you wouldn't want to put your ground control points just at the center line, if you will, of that highway all the way down because you'd have that linear axis all your points are on and you could have warping around that. 
In this case here, we've distributed our points such that you get good triangulation amongst your ground control points. And that triangulation is what's really going to keep your project nice and flat and level at the locations it's supposed to be at. And then also be mindful that you don't put your ground control points too close to the project edge. When you go through and we're going to start marking some ground control points here in a bit, we want to make sure that we have images from all different aspects or perspectives around that ground control point. If all of our images are just off to like one particular side or direction, we'll end up skewing or weighting our result in that, or that direction a little bit. And so we want to make sure we can mark images from a well-distributed selection around each ground control point. And lastly, think about the visible area you're working in. Try to avoid having it near tall buildings or any obstruction that might make it more difficult to see in photos. Having your GPS points out in open areas where they have sort of avoid shadows and overhangs, tall buildings, et cetera. Improve the visibility as much as possible. And then so when I go out to collect my GPS data, I like to always make sure I follow these different um, procedures here. Always use a target that has a clearly defined center, such as we can see in the graphic here on ground control point five. You can tell the center pixel very clearly. You want a high contrast colors like this black and orange target or a black and white. Typically, and it'll depend on what kind of background or what kind of surface you're putting it on. Like if you were putting something out on a beach type of environment, sort of a white and black target on a sandy environment may not work so well. Having a black and orange would work better. That way you're contrasting with the background surface. You wanna make sure your targets are what we'll call non-reflective in nature. And typically most um, store-bought targets are, but if you're going out and you're building your own target out of like maybe linoleum tiles from the hardware store or something like that, you wanna avoid things that are highly reflective. That'll cause issues with your images. And as far as the size of the target you're looking for, we found that really having a, ten, um, a ground control target that's roughly 10 times the size of your expected project GSD or ground sampling distance. So the projects that I will be working with here today, I have between a half inch and a one inch ground sampling distance. And so that means we'd want, and if we at a one inch ground sampling distance, you'd want roughly a 10 inch or a, a, a foot size target at the smallest. And having a larger target does certainly make it easier to see and identify your, your targets in your models. And when I'm going and collecting the data, things that I always make sure to make note of is I make note of my GPS antenna height to make sure that I have it set to the prescribed, in my case, it's two meters, but always know your antenna height. I always like to validate the orientation of my hardware as well. Depending on what GPS equipment you're using, there'll be a specific workflow for that hardware. The equipment I use does specify that the control panel on the GPS itself should be facing north. So I always make note of my orientation. And I also like to make note of my start and stop time or the occupation length of the data. And depending on what kind of equipment you're using, if you have access to what we'll call RTK or real-time kinematic GPS in an RTK network, you can actually collect data relatively quickly. The equipment I have is a little bit slower. I use static type of collection that I submit to the Opus website. And so typically I like to do occupation times of no, no less than 30 minutes, and I prefer to do over two hours when possible. And then it's always a good idea to capture some type of an image or a sketch of any ground control points you're using, such as this screenshot here I show of my GPS equipment set up on ground control point five. That can be very helpful for the person who's processing the data if it's not the person who set up the GPS targets themselves. That way you can very easily visually confirm, yes, the GPS was set up and we're measuring that center part of the target. We're not marking a corner or an edge or something like that. It's great to have a good camera capture of that location. And then whenever in doubt, it's always good to contact a local licensed land surveyor. This webinar is not intended to teach you how to capture the most accurate GCP points, but really more about how to mark those within the software. And capturing accurate data out in the field often is necessary to contact or correspond with a local licensed land surveyor to get the most accurate, correct data. So let's talk about how we compile the data that we get to add into the software to really make the pixels meet the, the road, if you will, here. So what we want to start with is we want to create a GCP file or a ground control point file that really can be a text file, .txt, a CSV, a comma delimited file, or even an XML file. I'm not a big fan of the XML myself. I usually use the TXT or the CSV format. And then when you go to create the data, you just simply need to format it such that the data 
has both an ID identifying the point you're talking or the point itself, a point label, if you will, and then the X, Y, and Z coordinate values for that. And we'll use then what's called the GCP MTP manager to enter that into the software. And it is important to know the order of the coordinate pairs that you're getting. And I mention this because I've found over time that what I'll call GIS folks, such as myself, speak a slightly different language than what surveyors speak. When you work with a surveyor, they'll often tell you information about the points in what they'll call northings and eastings, which is essentially the y-axis and the x-axis. Whereas when you're dealing with a GIS individual such as myself, we typically refer to things more in the reference to a Cartesian plane of x and y. And what's the difference really between those? Nothing significantly other than the order that the pair comes in. When you're getting data from a surveyor, they'll often provide that to you in YXZ format. And when you're getting it from a GIS person, you might be getting it in an XYZ format. And it's important that you know which order your coordinates are in. And we'll go through how to tell if you've got them in the wrong order, if you will, here in just a few moments. And then so you just need to create a simple text file like we see here in the left where I have a GCP ID, comma, X, comma, Y, comma, Z for each of the points I have in my project. And some tips or tricks that I found very helpful is that when I create my text file with my ground control point names and data in them, I like to name that text file in a very clear, concise manner that tells me what the coordinate system is that that data inside of the file represents. And so in this case, I've named my file GCP underscore Hoffman underscore CEO for Colorado State Plains Central 0502 CSV. And it's a very simple file here. And when you're going and you're putting files together for your project, I would encourage you to consider using a file structure that I have shown here below, such that you have a project folder on your computer. And inside of that project folder, I'll create these four separate subfolders, if you will. My first folder, 01 images, will contain all of my images for that project. My 02 control file will contain any information about the control ground control points. So I'll have my CSV or text file that I'm going to import into PIX4D. I'll also have a copy of my Opus reports that I get back from my differential correction. And I'll have a copy of my photos that I took of each of my GCPs all there in my control file so I can refer back to those for reference throughout my project. Then I have this other project folder called O3 project. And that's where the actual PIX4D project itself will be saved and all the outputs from that. And then also I have a separate folder 04 boundary that I like to use to contain any um, type of a KML or shape file that may have been provided to me to delineate what the area of interest is or the area that is designated to be mapped. And by having all my project data separated into these four separate folders that are in a, a file or a folder together for the project, it allows me to easily find the data that I'm looking for and keeps all the data together and helps me share that with folks later. And so let's get into the, like the actual part of the software about how you go about marking GCP data within PIX4D. And so before we dive into the software, I have just a couple more slides here I want to talk about. And so this slide here talks about or shows the GCP MTP manager. And so when we get into the MTP manager, the first thing I want to point out is that the top area here talks about the GCP coordinate system. And it's always important to select the GCP coordinate system that reflects the coordinate, the values of the coordinates that you're using. And it's also best if you can have your ground control points in the same coordinate system that your output coordinate system would be. And so in this case here, we um, will, we'll, when we add in our points, we'll go through and we'll update our ground control point coordinate system. Then we'll import our GCP text file then we can go about marking our points using one of two ways. We have both what we call a ray cloud editor that I'm down here on the left, and we also have a basic editor. And these two have different functionality. I, they both mark ground control points, but the basic editor is something that you use prior to step one processing. And then after you've run step one processing, the software will then have created a ray cloud at the, or a, a sparse point cloud at the end of step one. Then you can use the ray cloud editor a little bit more user-friendly and streamlined, but we'll go over both of those here in today's presentation. And then I just want to talk briefly about coordinate systems, uh, 
and where you find these definitions of them, if you will. And so when you go in and are working within the coordinate manager, when you want to edit or update the coordinate system you're using for your ground control points, when you first click on the edit the coordinate system, you come up and it shows this screen here about select GCP coordinate system. And you just get a few little choices of units you can set to feet or meters, then arbitrary coordinate system or a known coordinate system. Then there's this button here in the left-hand corner that I have circled in the graphic called Advanced Coordinate Options. If you click on that button, the window will expand out and show more information, and then you'll see the data that's shown here on the right, where you'll get some additional buttons that pop up where you can import a defined coordinate system from either a PRJ file, from a list built into the software, or from this, it was something called a, from EPSG, which stands for European Petroleum Survey Group Code. And then last but not least, there's actually another link here at the bottom. It says more projection systems.prj available at spatialreference.org. And this is a super handy way to get coordinate systems that may not already be built into the PIX4D software. And so let's just take a moment here and let's bring up that particular website here. Hopefully we can still see my screen. So this is the spatialreference.org website. And what's handy about this website, you can just follow the link directly on the on the page here within PIX4D. You can click on that link when you're in the software and it'll take you out to this website right here, the spatialreference.org. And I had a customer contact me one time from Kentucky who was looking to use a coordinate system that he couldn't find within PIX4D. And so I was able to help him by coming out to this website here and having him type in the search term that he was looking for and he was looking for a specific kind of coordinate system in Kentucky. So I just typed in the search term Kentucky and I've typed it in earlier here so I can type that. And when I hit the search function, the spatialreference.org website will list out all of the known defined coordinate systems for the area of Kentucky. And so in this case here, the gentleman was asking for a code, I believe it was EPSG 3090 for a NAD 83 Harren, Kentucky single zone. And lo and behold, that code wasn't already built into PIX4D. So if you click on the coordinate system code here, the EPSG code, you can click on that and it'll take you out to a website here where you can actually download then a PRJ file. And if I click on that PRJ file, we can see that the software is downloading this small little text file to my computer. And then I'll show you how we can leverage that within the PIX4D software next. So once you've gone out and you have the appropriate coordinate system from perhaps spatialreference.org or from another known source, we'll go ahead and we'll dive into the software here. I'm just going to bring this over to my other screen. So in this software right here, as we're looking at it, we can see that within the software here, this is what you first get when you load data into PIX4D. You get this map view that shows where all of my images were captured at and how the flight line was going, this red line here. And so up in the upper left-hand corner, if I mouse over this icon here that looks like a sort of a crosshair that you might find on a, a scope or something, that's the MTP GCP manager. So I can click on that and it brings up my GCP MTP manager area here where I can now go through and I can validate or check the coordinate system that I have here. And in this case, it's Datum North American Datum 1983 coordinate system at 83 Colorado State playing Central FIPS 0502 feet 2D. And that's okay. So what I can do is go import GCPs. And here I have this option where it says coordinate orders. I have XYZ and I have YXZ. So let's just choose YXZ here to start and I'll hit browse. And I can browse out and I can see my folder structure I created here. I have O2 control. So if I go into my O2 control file, I see I have my CSV file there. And when I import that data, list, select that data, I can hit OK. And the software is giving me this message. It says one or more GCPs lie far outside the area covered by the images. Check if the correct GCP file and coordinate system are selected. And so it shows the file that I selected and also then the, um, the coordinate system down below. And if I hit OK here and hit OK one more time, we'll see that the software zooms out and shows such that the project that we're working with is down here in Denver. But I see this blue cross way up here outside of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, it looks like. So it seems as if the software has thought my ground control points are actually in Yellowstone while my project's in Denver. So something was wrong with my ground control points there. So if I go back in and I remove my report ports, this time I'll import my GCPs again, but instead of YXZ, I'll choose the XYZ form, browse to that folder and under O2 control, select my folder. 
when I hit OK, I don't get that error message this time. And if I close my GCP MTP manager to see where my points are when I hit OK, it takes just a moment, but the software kind of recalculates and reformulates. And now it's showing us again here my project area with all of my red photos being shown. And now we can see the blue crosses that appear within the image. And those are roughly where my ground control points are located at. So if I open up my GCP MTP manager again, I can see here this is a new project. Both steps one, two, and three are red down below under processing on the bottom of the screen here. So I can see that nothing has been run. I don't have a ray cloud yet, and that's why the ray cloud editor is grayed out. But I can use the basic editor here to go ahead and as it says here under the GCP MTP editor, the information says, in order to compute 3D position of a GCP MTP, it needs to be marked on at least two images. In order to take GCP into account for georeferencing the project, at least three GCPs are needed to be marked. Marking GCPs MTPs after step one, initial processing requires the user to run process reoptimize, and the GCP MTP, manage, MTP accuracy can be verified in the quality report of the rate cloud editor. So we've added in our points here and I need to go about starting to mark them now. So I'll just go down here and I'll select the basic editor to start my marking. And when the basic editor pops up, the basic editor window consists of three different components or areas. I have this upper area that's a table that covers the um, information I input as far as my X, Y, and Z coordinates. And it also comes up with some accuracy information as far as the level of horizontal and vertical accuracy. Those are estimated in these point zero two zero values are default. I can go in and if I needed to or wanted to update those, I can simply double click within the, the field. Oop, I can't do that here. I've got to do that in another window. I apologize. But I can update my 3D GCP. Oh, actually, no, I was in a different field too. I'm getting out ahead of myself. So what we can do now is start marking these images. And we have five different ground control points listed at the top. And then here below, I have a list of all of my images and a thumbnail of the top image. I can see under my images area, I have the ability to sort those images alphabetically, A to Z, or I can use this middle option that says sort images by distance to GCP. Or the last option is to sort images by distance to marked images. And right now I don't have any marked images. So if I just mouse over this top image here, I can see that it, it's being shown here below. And if I use my mouse cursor, I'm just gonna mouse over and just use the, I can use either the magnifying glass on the screen to zoom in and I can see here this target. I'll zoom in here now. So I can see just my ground control point here in the spot. And as I zoom in a little bit further, I wanna make sure I'm zooming down to what I call the pixel level, where I can see individual pixels on my screen. I don't wanna mark my ground control target out when I see the whole thing like this. If I mark that, it looks like I marked fairly accurately with my yellow cross, but if I zoom in, I could see that eh, maybe that's not really the spot I wanted. I wanted it just a little bit over, maybe more right, right there. And so zooming into that pixel level, is really the, the key to getting good markings of your GCPs. And so I've marked this first image. I can see now that it's turned to green in the images list. And now I can simply go down to the second image. Then again, scroll in, zoom in on that particular spot there. And I can go ahead and mark that image as well. And so now I've marked that in two images and I can see here the or in the table at the top that there's a number two now that is updated off to the side here. And that indicates I've marked two images. And in the images list, I can see that the first two images are highlighted green. And that indicates that those are the two images I marked. And then I can just continue that. And I don't have to go through and mark every image that sees this GCP in the basic editor. Right now, I'm just trying to define parallax, if you will, within the software so that it knows kind of where the images were taken in relation to the data on the ground that we're marking. And so my goal right now is to mark at least three ground control points in two or more images. And so that's only six images that have to be marked here in the basic editor. It's not really time efficient to spend extra time to mark all of the images in the, the basic editor. It's not as efficient. And I'll show you a slicker workflow in the RayCloud editor in just a moment. But let's go ahead here now and mark um, GCPs two and three in a couple of images. So I'm just gonna highlight GCP two in the table above. When I highlight that, it lists all the images in order from distance from that point. So I can see here in this image, my GCP happens to be kind of here in the middle. So I just zoom in there. Once again, I want to zoom into that pixel level, mark my GCP. I get the yellow cross. It updates the icon green in the list. And it also added a one to my table up above showing I've marked one image. If I select down to my second image here, I can see that target again kind of pops out that black and orange really kind of helps stand out and makes it easy to see. 
zoom right in, mark that centroid pixel again where I think my GCP was located. Now I can just go up to my table. Let's move on to GCP3. And so this one here, again, you hopefully you see it kind of here, the green target in the middle of the, the grassy field. You just simply zoom in, go to that pixel level and mark it, go down to a second image. And at this point in time now, I've marked six images and I can see I have here in my table up above, it shows GCP one, two, and three have each been marked in two with a green two next to it. So at this point in time, I've actually marked my GCPs. If I hit okay, I can kick back out here. And at this point in time, I, if I slip into the ray cloud, uh, since I haven't processed this yet, I can see here how my five points are, have been located in space and space here, but I don't have any data with it yet. So at this point in time, what I'd want to do is I'd want to run step one processing. And at the end of step one processing, then I would get my, sp my sparse point cloud and help, help me then to be able to go back and mark the rest of the images with the rest of the GCPs. So in order to save some time, I've already kind of run this processing step, if you will. And we can go ahead here and let's go ahead out to our uh, second project. I have already started here. Here we go. And so in this project here now, we can see that I already have some ground control points and I've run actually steps one, two, and three already through on this one here. But if I'd only been through step one or two, I could see these points here. And I have some extra manual tie points here, but the 3D ground control points are these three here at the bottom. We have, uh, it shows 3D GCP or 3D, and then it shows one, and I've marked that in two images. GCP two, I see that's been marked in two images. And in this case here, this was a, from a different run, I had marked GCP four in this instance, and I marked it in two images. And I wanted to point out some key elements here as we're marking images. So we go back here and we look at ground control point one, I'm going to minimize the information on the right-hand side here. So we can see each of the images that, ref that represents ground control point one. And I can see in the top two images, there is a yellow circle and a cross. If I zoom in on that a little bit closer, you kind of can see that in addition to the yellow circle, there is also a green cross and a blue circle with a blue dot in the center of it. And so what's happening is after you mark a couple of images, you establish parallax within the software such that the software is able to estimate kind of where that point should be in 3D space. And then you can more quickly mark subsequent images. And so for right now, let's go down here to GCP, like say five that I haven't marked in any ground control point or haven't marked in any images yet at all. And so when I click and highlight ground control point five in my layers list on my left-hand side, that makes it the active selected item then populates the right-hand window here with the information about that. I can see I'm working with under the selection area, it says, GCP5, 3D GCP has a label, the type it is. I can update here from a 3D GCP to a 2D, or if I wanted to change it to a manual tie point or a checkpoint, but we'll leave it as a 3D GCP. And so at this point in time here, what I can do is I can zoom in and start marking these points. And as I look at this first image here, we can actually see that, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. We can see that this image, as we zoom in here, there's no green cross or yellow cross or any of those other items. There's just a blue circle with a blue dot in it. And so this blue circle with the blue dot is the software's way of saying, this is where I think your ground control point is in a two dimensional world, not taking Z or Z into account. And so in this particular case here, that came in pretty close already, but I think yeah, it might be just right there. So when I click my first image, we'll see that the software makes that yellow cross and a yellow buffer around it. And then I can just pan down here to my second image and make these just a little bit smaller so we see multiple images on my screen at the same time. And so here when I zoom in on my second image, I can now mark that. And now the software that I, since I've marked two images from two different vantage points, the same point, the software is now estimating where it thinks the ground control point would be. And it creates a green X on all the subsequent images going down saying, hey, this is where I think the point is based on what you've marked so far. And so it's not necessary that you go through and mark every GC, every image that shows the GCP, but you do want to strive to get about eight to 10 marks per ground control point. You're marking eight to 10 images, so you're getting points well distributed around. So you, after you mark that second point there, you can also I can go through and just kind of keep clicking here until you mark all your points. And it's much easier within the Ray Cloud Editor. There is a really handy tip or trick that I'd like to share with folks that when you mouse over an image, like my mouse is over, let's scroll up here just a bit so I can see. So I'm in, over image 317 right now. 
if I use the space bar on my keyboard, that will blow that image up to a full screen and that will allow me to have more detail, if you will, within the photo and it allows me to not work within this little window off to the side here. And I find that to be very helpful. And then you may notice that we have this yellow buffer around my point that I make. And the size of that yellow buffer will vary depending on how far out zoomed I am when I mark it. So there I zoomed way out and I made a mark. And you can see it made a big buffer around my target. The size of the yellow buffer around your marking is inversely proportional to the weight the software will apply to that marking when it's processing. So you always want to be sure, like here is, as I zoomed out to a kind of a far level and kind of clicked, like, oh, I think that's the center right there. When you zoom in further, you can see that you can be off by quite a number of pixels if you're not into that zoom to that pixel level. And so it's always good to zoom into that pixel level to make your marks. And then as we go through, we can see the images that have been marked have the yellow circle on it. And I can use these global slider bars at the top of the screen here to adjust the si uh, both my zoom level and also my image size. So it kind of allows me to kind of increase the number of images I have on my screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there a question there? I heard some. some, some... No. OK. So as we continue to, to go here, so now I can see here all of the images that represent ground control point five on my image. And I happen to know that ground control point five is kind of up here in the top part of the image. Yeah, I'm not sure we uh, we had some other people that managed to start talking, but Aaron, are you are you still there? Aaron, sounds like we we lost audio. Hold on. See if we can uh, reestablish things here for a moment. Go to webinar has been very, very weird today. So trying our best to work around some of its technical issues today. Let's give him a minute, see if we can get back in. Uh, so many people doing webinars these days, I think it's a little overwhelming uh, go to webinar lately. See, somehow his audio completely dropped off. Oh, good times, good times. Well, have you guys been uh, learning something so far? See if, uh, you know, see what people are thinking of this so far. I know it's fairly complicated stuff, but hopefully it's been useful up to this point. Hopefully Aaron can get back in here. Good. Oh, thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. How 
how many of you are currently doing um, mapping projects right now? I like to get a kind of a feel for how many of you are looking to do it or how many are you actually doing it right now? Doing it quite often. All right. Four plus years. Nice. Good. You're looking to get into it, Lance. Okay. That's cool. <clears throat> David, not yet. Just interested. Um, tons of possibilities. Absolutely. Yeah. So many, so many opportunities to uh, do stuff with mapping and uh, modeling. So much stuff to get to uh, that you can possibly do. Uh, just started looking to do it. Stacy, good. All right. Looking to do it, trying to learn as much as possible and practicing. Um, so if if any of you want to do some practice uh, without investing in the software, contact us. Uh, send an email to enterprise at multicopterwarehouse.com and we can hook you up with a uh, little trial license of PIX4D. So definitely uh, be able to help you out there and get things going, get you a little trial version. Looking to start soon. Uh, Van, um, well, I'm talking at the moment. Aaron is having trouble getting back in. Uh, only done a couple, all right. You got your picks 4D essentials. Nice. Good job, Robert. Still hoping to do it. Been using it uh, through another platform for two years. Excellent. All right. So Can you hear me? try the computer audio again. No. So let me, I'll send this out to everyone. Enterprise at multicopterwarehouse.com for a license. Okay. Oh, you're doing LIDAR. Excellent. Pro bono work for conservation. Excellent. Recommendations on good resources for renting GPS equipment. Um, ooh. You know, I don't know. I'm not really sure who rents out equipment. Um, where are you at, David? Uh, what's what state are you in? Uh, David, for a geology project, has been using lidar. Uh, we're going to have a a very affordable, I mean, relatively affordable lidar product soon. Uh, be, it's going to be much more affordable than some of the other LiDAR solutions that are out there. And it's going to be very interesting. Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to talk about that here fairly soon. Wisconsin, yeah, I don't I don't know who in that area would rent GPS equipment. So, um, not quite sure. So, um, Aaron's having to actually completely reconnect at the moment. So... Hopefully he'll be back on here in just a second. So just bear with us. Doing a project in central Utah, but live in Golden, excellent. Uh, how affordable am I talking? I'm talking about 35,000 uh, instead of 100,000. So about a third of the cost of a typical GPS, I mean, a typical LiDAR system. And that's 35,000. Basically, all inclusive the hardware, not the aircraft. It'll run on a, it'll fly on an M200 or an M300 or an M600. Uh, but it's it's the lidar hardware, the ground station, and all of the processing software. So it's pretty much everything in one shot. Uh, so for what it is, it's an excellent price. Dirt pile volumes, excellent construction of PDF drawings, underlay, pre-construction, great. Um, it's a the lidar is a drone attachment. It's it's for flying on an M200 or M300 
or it can also be put on an, on an M600. Uh, this, this webinar will be posted online. Yep, I'll do a little editing to uh, get through some of the technical problems, but uh, we'll, we'll definitely, this will definitely be on our YouTube channel at Multicopter Warehouse and all of our other ones are currently there. So you can definitely check that out. Let me uh, work on Aaron here in just a moment. Okay, hopefully uh, Aaron is gonna be back with us in just a second. Do you need to do GCPs for volumetric? Well, that's a great question. I mean, technically no. Um, where your GCPs are, are going to be handy are going to be when you need to position something in, in relation to where it actually is on the planet. So if you're just trying to get a stockpile measurement, you don't really care if its position on Earth is off a few meters. You're just trying to get um, get the volume. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. Oops, lost my place in all these questions. Uh, drone attachment with a trust. Yes. Uh, does that LIDAR work inside buildings? Um, I mean, technically it can. It's not a spinning laser type, so it doesn't do side scan, but you can, um, it's, it's basically, you normally would point it straight down and have a 40 degree field, uh, field of view, but if you wanted to do a wall, you could just tilt it up, but then you'd have to rotate all the way around versus a indoor LIDAR, which you can set up on a tripod and it can do basically the whole room in one shot. So it's a little different than what you would traditionally use. Uh, do you need to verify the scale? Um, there's more to doing volumetrics than um, I can oversimplify here, but I believe August 5th, we are going to do a webinar on how to do stockpile analysis. Uh, suggestions for best handheld unit to acquire GCPs? Well, you can use the DJI DRTK2 if uh, you want something that's fairly affordable. I mean, standalone, it's $4,000. And usually with the, an aircraft, uh, it tends to add about 2,500 to the cost. So uh, right in there, or you can go with something like a Trimble Hyper-V or something uh, and you know spend $14,000, $15,000. When is a good mapping cam camera coming out for the M300 Q4? So uh, that's what I have been told, sometime around Q4 we should have um, a oblique camera for the M300. Uh, can you talk about checkpoints and where to get them? Um, not quite sure. I'm going to see if like if Aaron is getting somehow getting back on here. I'm not sure what's going on. He dials in and doesn't do anything. Uh, like these. Yeah. I give up. I can't get back on. I'm not going to talk to everything. So there was a question about checkpoints. Yeah, I mean it says you're unmuted here. I, I, my audio is not working. <laughs> it's frustrating. Both computer and. Phone. Yeah, I tried by I tried dialing in on the phone and I tried using the computer thing, and neither of them were working worth a hoot. Okay. Uh, why don't you keep answering the questions? We'll see if I can. Okay, do we have? Okay, so let's answer some of the questions I see coming in here. 
We talked about the clearer camera for the M210 with mechanical shutter or something better than the X5S. Not at this time, unfortunately. Um, DJI has discontinued production of the X4S, and the X5 and the X7 are really more geared for videography, not so much photography. Hopefully, we'll have updates as more information comes out, but right now, I don't have a good camera suggestion for photogrammetry on the M210. Can you talk about checkpoints and where you get them? A checkpoint's really the exact same as a ground control point. So when you're putting your ground control points out across your project and you go to mark those, it's just a matter of marking one as a checkpoint or as a ground control point. So you can use the exact same target on the ground if you want, not the exact, use the same type of target, et cetera. And it's not anything special. It's just the way that the software is leveraging the data that with a checkpoint, the data doesn't, the software doesn't look at the XYZ data until all the processing is done and then validates how close your measurement was to the calculated value. And, and the checkpoint is, or and the ground control point is processed during, during the project itself. And we already answered that one. Is there a camera? And then I see here, is there a certain time of day better than to fly to get data? That's a great question. And really, I think in an ideal world, somewhere between the hours of about 10 and 2, you want to be able to fly, if possible, when the sun is at its highest altitude or elevation over the Earth. That way you're getting those sun rays coming down directly and you'll get fewer shadows. If you have the opportunity to photograph or do drone mapping on a slightly cloudy overcast day where you're not getting that direct sunlight and those harsh shadows and dark areas around trees and buildings, that's really an ideal time to do it because when you're looking to get good quality images and so whenever you have the best quality lighting, you don't necessarily need to have a blue sky day to get a good quality map, but having an overcast kind of cloudy day where you don't have much shadows is really an optimal time to do it. See here, we have another question coming in. If uh, see here, if you if you do not have a ground station, can you still get accurate data? Not very easily. It is possible to go out and extract data from some web mapping sources, um, but typically, like if you try to zoom into Google Earth at its highest resolution, each pixel on the ground is just six inches. And certainly the Google imagery is not going to have your ground control point targets reflected in them, but you might be able to leverage visible points within your project area, whether it be the corner of a parking stripe or the corner of a handicap parking zone icon or sticker or something like that. And the handicap icon is difficult because sometimes cars will park on top of it. You may not see it, but sometimes you can find parking or markings on parking lots or roads or something like that that you can try to leverage but it's really ideal if you can set out and pick your own ground control points ahead of time as far as having a specified target laying it on the ground and collecting the data let's see here we have and does does rtk system help so does having an rtk system help with mapping having the rtk system allows you to get much more precise values for the gps on the drone while it's flying but ultimately, you do still need to put out a couple of ground control points on the ground, or we'll call them checkpoints, really, at this point. You don't need them as ground control points. But you want to have some checks on the ground that you can leverage to validate the accuracy of your data. So even having an RTK drone, that'll save you a lot of time on the back end as far as you won't need to put out as many ground control points. You won't need to do both ground control and checkpoints. But you still need to have a couple of checkpoints to validate your data. And the next question here, like the P4 RTK or P4 or M210 RTK, yes, yeah, certainly having, once again, those RTK um, capable drones will cut down on the amount of field work you need to do because you only need to gather checkpoints and not really ground control points themselves. And do I need a network to tie to to use the RTK function? Yes, you do. And so if you're trying to leverage the RTK abilities, you do need to connect into a RTK network of some kind. And so that would be um, something to look at within your particular area of operation if you want to leverage the RTK, RTK capabilities. But even if you don't have that live real-time connection out in the field, you can always still do what we'll call PPK or post-processing kinematic. So it takes a few more steps to 
differentially correct the, the data from the drone, but it can be done. Thoughts on aero, aero pads. So uh, the aero pads, are these the propeller aero pads? The, actually a very handy tool, we do have those here at Multicopter Warehouse if you're interested in getting a hold of some of those. Some of the things about the aero pads that I like and don't like, they're very handy as far as going out and setting them up. You just kind of let the, set them down on the ground, push the button, and then once you're done with your mission, you come back and you pick them back up. So that can be very handy, but sometimes I believe it's a little bit more challenging if you're trying to get back to the exact same point because there's no kind of hole or grommet, if you will, within the aero pad targets themselves. And I like to put down a PK or a known point nail or a nail within my pro or on my project GCP point. That way, when I go back, I can put my GPS directly back up on that same little divot in that known point nail. Whereas that's a little bit tougher to do with the aero pads, but for efficiency wise, you really can't beat aero pads. They have a template that you kind of spray paint around and you can put the target back in the same spot, but to each their own. It is a good quality product though. And so I, I don't, if you don't have RTK network, do you have a PPK workflow recommendation? Um, there are, there's a PPK available from DJI. And if you'd like to send me an email at awoods at multicopterwarehouse.com, I'll do my best to forward you a copy of that. I don't have it here at my disposal right now to share, but yeah, I'd be happy to hear about the particular hardware you're using and help you with the workflow you need there. And is there a local GPS coordinate system? Is, is there free local GPS coordinate system networks? There are in some locations. I myself previously did work in both Alaska and Hawaii. At this point in time, both of those locations do not have free RTK network information, but I know that there is data that can be gotten in different kinds of different states. I would check with um, local surveyors within your state. They can certainly get you clued into any kind of local GPS coordinate system networks you might be able to access. And is RTK faster than PPK total time to process? That's a good question. And so when you have really accurate, what we'll call pose information or kind of orientation information for each of your images, you can speed up processing because the PIX4D algorithm doesn't have to spend as much time trying to determine how all the images were oriented. But overall, it's not that much substantially faster. And so the biggest time savings is really not so much on the processing side of things, but on the field as far as you don't have to take the time to fix your images and update their geotags before you enter them into PIX4D for processing. So the RTK flow would be faster in that regards. But overall, I mean, it's more field time by not having to do as many checkpoints and ground control points by having that RTK network that you're really saving, on, saving with. And that's all the, the questions I, I seem to have here right now. I do certainly apologize for that technical snafu. If anybody is having any kind of questions on how to go about marking GCP data, once again, please feel free to reach out to me directly. And I'm happy to, uh, my email address is awoods at multicopterwarehouse.com. And I'm certainly happy to correspond or have a, a call with you and help you out with your, your workflow information there.